All right. Hello. Oh, we can hear me all right. Uh, yeah, so I'm Pete Cheslock. We're here to talk about why we can't have nice things. Um, so I've had this idea of this talk for a while, and, and I've given it a few different places. And really, uh, it's come about as the last few years as DevOps has really kind of come into mainstream. And my problem with DevOps is that I feel like we talk about devs and ops and getting them to work better together, but we kind of ignore security uh, and security teams and, well, just security in general. Um, and so, you know, just want to talk a little bit about that, especially as my experience as a traditionally non-security person. I've done ops most of my life and uh, never really had to uh, work uh, with a lot of security people very often. Um, so yeah, again, my name is Pete Cheslock. I work for a company called ThreatStack. Uh, we actually have a booth out here. We're sponsoring this event. And what we do is uh, we, we have uh, uh, some software, a SaaS service that can help you identify your internal and external threats, help you identify data loss, and try to just answer who did what when. I've been working there for a few years now, and I uh, run the operations team and really just help out at wherever as, as a normal startup would do. Um, like I said before, you know, I, I'm not traditionally, I don't consider myself a security person. I think people uh, make fun of me for that quite a bit because I work for a security company. Um, but a lot of what I've learned from a kind of a security mindset uh, and how that relates to, to DevOps has really come about in the last few years. And the nice thing I think is I've seen, especially in the DevOps communities, this is actually my first uh, uh, Lisa event, uh, but in the, the DevOps communities, you know, you're seeing a lot more security talks, which is phenomenal. More people are talking about it, which is great. Um, but just a few years ago, it was all, let's talk about Jenkins and CI and, and moving really, really fast, uh, which is great. We should move fast, but can we move fast and can we do it securely? So I'm only going to say one slide about DevOps, and it, it kind of pertains to the, um, the security mindset. But you know, we say here uh, the, the line that actually means I'm not going to read the whole thing. But the line that means the most to me is, you know, it means you know, giving a shit about your job enough to want to learn all the parts, um, not just your little world. Um, so. Whenever I see people that talk about DevOps and they're doing the DevOps things like that, and they're not talking about security, they're not caring about that. That's someone else's group. I just reminded of what we used to say ten years ago or so, with like, I, I'm, you know, that's a dev problem or that's an ops problem. Um, you know, we really should try to learn more and understand areas of our uh, of, of our you know systems um, than than just our kind of maybe major areas we need to look at. So in the past, uh, you know, I've worked with auditors and dedicated infosec teams. And especially now, more recently in the security space, I feel like we're reaching this, this inflection point um, when it comes to infosec teams and the rest of technology. I mean, if you're at a larger company, you probably have a security team. And in the past, maybe still now, they're the ones who tell you no and stop and um, slow you down in a lot of ways. You know, I want to use the cloud. You can't use the cloud. Not secure. You know, or whatever. Um, and so I feel like we're kind of at this point where, uh, where, where, where devs and ops teams were in you know, you know, 2009, um, just, just not that many years ago. So, so years ago, uh, in a lot of uh, talks on DevOps, there was this slide deck. There was the wall of confusion. And in the past, you'd have you know, your devs on one side and your ops on the other. And the classic move was the devs took the code, threw it over the wall, and you know, good, luck, good luck ops people. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, now the dev and the ops are on the same side of the wall, um, for better or for worse. But now I feel like they're just tossing over uh, to the security team uh, when things are done. Um, they'll deploy their code. They will uh, ship new servers. Is that server patched? Is it running a recent kernel version? Who knows? Like, let's have fun. Um, and so, you know, you have basically an unhappy security team. And so the DevOps are, they're having a great time, right? Unicorns and happiness, they're living in perfect harmony. They're embracing change. They are embracing continuous delivery. Um, and, and either that InfoSec team is not uh, being included, uh, or maybe they just don't want to be included. Um, you know, if you remember the DevOps conversation in that early time, operations teams didn't like change. And so change brought instability, and instability woke them up in the middle of the night. And for InfoSec, change brings fear and it brings uncertainty as well. Uh, and <clears throat> since you never included that InfoSec team into your you know, fancy continuous build pipeline, um, change also brings usually software and systems that are untested for vulnerabilities. So security is on the minds of everyone. Uh, I'm, I, I like to cook. I like to. I also like to eat. Uh, the Food Lab is uh, someone I follow a lot because they, they post a lot of interesting food stuff. Um, I just thought this was interesting. It was you know uh, someone who is arguably a, a non-tech person. They write cookbooks and and do um, food articles and stuff, reminding you that you're being man in the middle with GoGo and everything is at risk um, and to manage it appropriately. Um, security is on everyone's mind. So. Um, 
you know, as someone who likes to learn new things, um, I started by reading up um, uh, with you know videos about security practices. Um, uh, when I started at Threatstack, I was working with you know some some real experts in the security field, and I really just felt dumb all the time because they they knew a lot more about this than me. But um, you know, they were they were really helpful and started teaching me a lot of stuff. But you know, I wanted to go through and learn you know basic security hygiene. Um, but the one thing I noticed when it comes to basic security hygiene is there's a couple of things that we're doing. Um, what we should be doing is washing our hands. You know, really basic preventative thing. But what we do instead is just a lot of kind of crazy stuff that doesn't really make sense or really help us out in any way. Um, and I feel like this is what this talk represents. It's some simple things that you can do to improve your security posture. Um, a lot of people have uh, have talked to me after this talk and said, oh, you know, that's a lot of basic stuff. I'm not sure why you even bother telling people. And, and I constantly say, like, it is a lot of basic stuff, yet everywhere I go, no one does this stuff. Um, so my, my goal today is if you can learn one thing out of here, great. Um, if, if you just like to laugh at the unicorn poop slide, that's cool too. Um, so I'm a huge West Wing fan. Anyone here seen the West Wing? Um, so I've seen it and then rewatched it, I don't know, about eight times. So there's a quote that, that I was thinking of, um, you know, uh, as I was uh, dealing with some issues a few months ago with the new version of the Linux kernel that, was, that came out. And so um, the most costly disruptions always happen when something that we take completely for granted stops working for just a minute. So this really summed up uh, a new version of Linux kernel was shipped. And uh, it, was, it was a security update. Um, of course, you want to test your, you don't want to just YOLO that out to prod. You want to test it out to make sure everything works. Um, so I started, we, we, we use Amazon. We bake our images with that new system. We start deploying them out there, see what happens. And, and something very interesting started to happen. Uh, the, uh, for those of you who uh, use Ubuntu, you'll, you'll recognize um, whatever launch pad here for every kernel bug ever on Ubuntu. Um, so I started testing, I hit this fun error, and what this error is, um, not a lot of information here, but if you were running a very specific version of the kernel, and in this case it was like 3.16, who knows, uh, uh, and if you ran any sort of tool that integrated with the audit API, so if you ran audit D, um, and if you ran something like the Threstack agent, which also talks to the audit API, um, the system would enter into the scenario where no one including root, would be able to run any sort of command or fork any processes or do anything. Uh, so talk about a secure update. Uh, you're unable to literally do anything on the system anymore. Um, and so the biggest joke of, of this specific issue that, that we ran into is to upgrade my kernel with a security release, which I should be doing constantly, um, it will make my system completely unusable, but only if I'm using a tool that will help me audit for security. <laughs> like, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> So you're saying you're building secure systems. Um, I talk to people that say, I don't know when you can't talk to the internet, I got proxies, I got seven proxies, whatever. Um, how do you know you're not already using something that's fundamentally broken, right? You know, we, we use the software, we use it for years. I mean, these are the vulnerabilities that, you, that, that have logos. I'm not counting the ones that don't. That one's just the Canadian flag. That's not even a vulnerability. There's Millhouse over there. Um, <laughs> But a lot of these other ones are like legit vulnerabilities. And you say what you will about the, the marketing of new vulnerabilities, but they sure do raise awareness, which I think is better um, you know, in, this, in this world. This also doesn't even count uh, a, a new vulnerability in the Linux kernel that just got fixed that was there for like, I don't know, four years or something um, that uh, essentially you can break out of containers with it. I mean, you can local privilege escalation. So, you know, again, Heartbleed was one of, as you see, many examples of uh, software that you're probably running that is completely owned in some way and we just don't know about it yet. Um, and that was exploitable, obviously, for years before anyone found out about it. And so Heartbleed was bad, so were a lot of those other ones. The idea that someone could just grab your keys off your server and you'd never know. I mean, I, I wanted to open up a meatball shop that day. I was kind of done with computers. Um, but you know, then, then we had shell shock that happened after, and then, and then, and they just kept on coming. Um, and they still do to this day. It's never going to stop. There will always be uh, software that we're using will always have uh, security vulnerabilities. And so we have to manage that. Um, so what about vulnerabilities with curl? Um, it's a good thing that we don't use, you know, curl or bash to install software or anything. <laughs> that would be crazy. Um, so for my Linux users here, uh, for my non-Linux users here, uh, you know, using curl and bash is just 
grabbing scripts from the internet and just running them at random uh, to install software is, is become this new prevalence in the world. And, and I can hate on a, a curl bash and unauthenticated installing software um, until you start talking about installing packages from Yum and, and um, apt, apt and Yum repos and realize that GPG doesn't even work on, on those and there's been bugs in that forever. So um, this is fine though, everything is fine. Um, and again, I, I've said this before, but as an ops person, I don't, uh, security is not a forefront of my mind, especially a lot of startups I've worked at. Um, you're moving so fast, uh, you, the money will run out eventually, you gotta get servers up and running, you need the servers to stay up and running. Uh, hopefully you're successful, but then unfortunately now you gotta just keep the servers running, keep the servers running. Um, and so security is always the afterthought. Um, it's always the thing that's that's handled, you know, years down the road. Um, sometimes never, as we've seen with a lot of these breaches um, more recently. But I really try to do the right things. Um, I try to use strong passwords, least privileged access. I try to log for unauthorized access, kind of the simple stuff that you should be doing. Um, but it's always an afterthought. What about security updates? Um, we talk about uh, you know immutable infrastructure, this dream world where I bake all my images and I deploy them out, and like that's awesome uh, that you roll new images for all your stuff. But how often are you rolling your databases? Um, you know, we run Cassandra as one of our databases, and Cassandra operationally is great to update. You can you know reload and 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 rebuild whole racks of Cassandra clusters with new kernel versions or whatever. But are you going to roll whole new like images for your Cassandra cluster? Um, are you going to move hundreds of gigs or terabytes or petabytes of whatever data? Um, you know, probably not. But also, too, like how many times have simple security features uh, been released that fundamentally break how the system works? Um, remember that audit thing I just mentioned before. Like we're trying to be secure and use the latest kernel versions, and it's completely <laughs> screwing us over. You know, it's just a patch, right? How bad could it be? Um, so there's a lot of systems out there, and I, I would say they take a casual approach towards security mostly around access controls. Uh, a lot of the newer databases, you know, Redis and, and Elasticsearch, they're better now, but you know, they're installed as, as default wide open go nuts, right? Um, SSL is usually an afterthought, TLS is an afterthought. You know, this idea that anyone in your network can just drop all data from your you know, key value store um, or just take down your Elasticsearch cluster with a simple curl, you know, again, it's, it's, it's fine, right? This is where risk assessment comes into play though. Um, and, and risk assessment is not just something for the auditors, it's something that, that we really do every day as operators in this, in this field. You, know, you consider that your web engineers come to you and they say, you know, we want to replace Postgres with you know, new hipster DB. It's really fast. It's 10 times faster, something like that. So you get to take this formula to that decision um, and it's really likely that those web engineers are actually going to be on call when there are issues with their new fancy really, really fast database. So we have to acknowledge that even if you don't have this dedicated security team, you, you can't pass the buck. If you are at a smaller startup or really just a tightly funded huge organization, um, you still have to kind of consider this as part of kind of the scope of your work. Um, and it's, again, just because you don't have that dedicated team, it doesn't mean it's no one's job. So you or your security team, if you're lucky enough to have one, likely both, um, are gonna make these same risk assessments when you use uh, SaaS services. Or maybe a third party that you're gonna use for central log management. Um, even some new internal database. You really wanna ask yourself, you know, what kind of data are you sending there? What happens if that system gets hacked? Um, how valuable is that data? Is there any value to the data? Are you encrypting it at rest? Um, is there a way to scrub this data before sending maybe to a SaaS service? Um, again, as, as someone who works for a company that, you, that is a SaaS service, I would urge people to use SaaS services, um, but I understand that people have security requirements that may not allow that. Um, you know, I don't think that we should make an excuse to just say blanket no SaaS services because we could be sending data off site. At the end of the day, you know, I have a product. I want to focus all my time on making the product the best, most secure thing for customers to use. I'm not an expert in a lot of other things. I want to leverage someone else's expertise for that. So you have to understand that risk when you're uh, looking at a SaaS service, um, but you have to really be wary because at the end of the day, you still own your security, um, and and just like the availability, security, security availability, performance, um, these are not features. These are things that should be um, should be built in and thought of from the start. So I just want to dive down in a little bit into some of the specific tools and techniques, things that honestly it were, uh, again, should have been simple, but uh, was a lot of the stuff that I learned and started doing just at ThreatStack. You know, when I started there, we had 
10 servers running our beta platform and we and we you know now ingest billions of events per day um, from our customers so um, you know the only way to do that and to do it quickly is to um, and securely is to really start you have to start somewhere right so I'll, I feel like I'm going to preach to the choir, but yet someday I still find people who, who have this aversion to configuration management. Um, but I feel like now, again, it's 2016, almost 2017, um, you need to have some sort of way as code to manage your systems. Um, it doesn't, it could be one of these, it could be custom bash scripts. I think at the end of the day, something that exists somewhere that is auditable and tracked, maybe in a source code repository, uh, would be great that you can use to manage your systems, keep it going. The main goal here is as these vulnerabilities are coming out, you can move very quickly, right? And again, this is kind of an obvious one. Um, at a past company, um, they uh, we didn't have a dedicated security team until after I had started. And the security team was kind of, I don't know if you call it classical, but they were more like going through attestations and, and not really like application security or, or system security people. Um, but as we started bringing those people on, what I, what I did is worked with them using a tool called Test Kitchen because I wanted them to have this ability to provision a, kind of a base instance of, of our stack. And they could do that locally. So Test Kitchen is kind of a wrapper around Vagrant. Um, it integrates with Chef uh, primarily, but it does integrate with Puppet. And the idea is, is that the security engineers could run Test Kitchen to build like a base stack. And what they would do is then they could audit that base stack in the, in, the, in the output of this fully configured box. And then what happened over time is that they started writing their own cookbooks and updating cookbooks. And they'd say, oh, the, you know, the permissions in this log directory are incorrect. Let me fix that. And they would, the security team would actually make these fixes. It wasn't like go and create a ticket and wait six months. Um, what was even more interesting is they started writing cookbooks to deploy things like AuditD or OSEC. Um, and then they started getting involved in the Jenkins pipeline and how can we do application testing at build time and things like that. In a lot of ways, it's not like they didn't want to do it or they didn't have time. It's, they just didn't know what was there. Um, you know, they have an expertise that is much different than an operations world. And so just a lot of times showing them what exists, showing them the, the tools that you're using, um, I was really impressed as to how quickly a lot of the security people, you know, dove into these things. Um, so does anyone here uh, operate a, uh, an external kind of paid service? Uh, you know, so the, the concept of a bug bounty, I think at this stage in the game, if you operate a service that is any sort of like, you know, external customers, you know, you should have a bug bounty program set up. I always look at it like United has a bug bounty. They're, they're not, I don't know, I don't consider them to be known very well for great customer service or reliable flights. But I mean, they have a bug bounty program. So, you know, you really should have one too. Um, if you do set up a bug bounty program, uh, even if you, you know, are not quite there yet, Give some way for people to contact you securely. Um, on your, your website for your business, have like a slash security endpoint that people can hit and they'll have all the information about how to contact you and what's in scope and things like that. But there's tools like HackerOne um, and Bug Crowd that make it easy to set up bug bounties where you can get people and, and budget for this, pay people to come in and find stuff in your environment. Um, you would be completely blown away about how quickly vulnerabilities will be found in your application when you open up a bug bounty program. Um, and as we know, I mean, there's companies like Facebook and GitHub, and again, all the largest ones pay great money for finding bugs. It, sh it kind of shocks me to find when, when small companies, you know, small startups don't have a bug bounty program. You know, at this point, they're so easy to set up. There's companies that'll help you do it. Show uh, So shared secrets, um, not just for you, but also for your infrastructure. Um, I think this is the hardest part of any topic on security. If you went to Noah's talk the other day, he talked about a lot of the different, um, kind of the state of you know, shared, shared secrets. Um, the best advice I can give when it comes to secrets management is to do something, uh, anything. Um, the current state of finding, uh, again, 2016, yeah, I'm st we still find uh, AWS access keys sitting around in GitHub repos, and we still find uh, secrets in, um, in, in source control. Um, don't put this problem off for another day. It's just going to get worse, and it's going to get worse. And I honestly don't think that you need some super complex solution to this one. Um, in, in a lot of cases, starting off as simple as just a shared one password database, something that this stuff can sit securely. Um, you know, as you grow and mature as a business, you know, you'll want something with audit controls, and you'll want something with role-based access and things like that. But for a lot of times, people just don't have anything, and they'll just say, "No, oh, there's a wiki page on Confluence with all of the logins and passwords for stuff." It's like, what? <laughs> so there's a lot of awesome tools out here. Um, this is 
probably just a small uh, portion of these. Um, the one of note, the, the tool at the bottom here is called JAS. Um, it's a really helpful tool. It can integrate um, with LDAP if, if you have LDAP and your SSH keys, but basically can encrypt data and secrets with, with someone else's SSH key. Um, again, as operators, I find this to be a really nice tool. Um, I believe it was in use over at Twitter. Um, they used it to share secrets around. So, you know, using tools like HipChat and Slack, these public chat services, um, it's, it's nice to have like a kind of quick, easy command line tool that you can just quickly encrypt some, some data and shoot it over to another person. Um, it's awesome, I will say, that, that these options exist. I mean, five years ago, none of those existed. Um, and, how, and how do you manage you know, secrets? It's probably build something yourself um, or just don't like most people did at the time. So I definitely love where, where we're at. Um, it, we can always get better and, and that's the hope is that we continue to get better. So does anyone know what, it, what this is a picture of? This is actually my favorite picture in the entire deck. Um, this is a, a webcam and those are two factor tokens. And I'm pretty sure the only bit of security on that webcam is it doesn't have a public IP address. Um, so two factor, uh, I feel like is, is, especially in this day and age, it's table stakes, you should have it. Um, I'm a huge fan of a uh, tool uh, from Duo. Duo. Any Duo security employees here? No, the Duo is a really awesome product. It's incredibly cheap. It's uh, so if you're a startup or a big company, it doesn't cost a lot to get going, um, and it's very easy to get set up to two-factor your you know your VPN endpoints, your SSH, your access for your users. Um, they have integrations into a ton of different stuff. Um, and you can pair these with you know, YubiKeys or you know, hardware tokens for really quick, easy, one-time password generation. Um, I mean, all in you're talking about $20 for the, you know, 20 to 30 bucks for a YubiKey with the service for your users. Um, and you're gonna sleep better at night because there's, there's only so much you can control. And especially with, everyone's got laptops and you know, they, they put them in their car, car gets broken into, um, or you know, they go to a cafe, they're working from a cafe and someone lifts their laptop. I mean, th this stuff happens, um, you know. Again, there are great SaaS services that help you, know, help you, through, um, you know, through these problems. So. so email encryption, which I feel like there were a few talks where people talked about email encryption, but um, I mean, email is the main one, but Email, I'm never gonna say email's dying because that's the most ridiculous statement ever. Um, but <laughs> we've been waiting for it to die for what, like 30 years now? Um, but now we have HipChat and now we have Slack and uh, I, you know, we see more and more companies using you know, chat tools versus email systems. Um, you know, at the end of the day, finding some way for people to communicate securely is still important. Um, you know, if you're using these, these SaaS services for chat systems, like just take the default strategy of not trusting them uh, because you can't trust it, right? Um, you know, don't share sensitive data in chat. It sounds so simple, but <laughs> shockingly enough, this happens all the time. You know, mistakes happen, <clears throat> you know, just don't make it a habit. Um, you know, one of the statements I like to say around this one is, do you have the ability to roll credentials easily in your environment? Um, if not, like, sounds like a good story for the next sprint. Um, you know, if someone does share some critical password or something like that, you should be able to roll it incredibly fast. So something that I did um, at ThreatStack when I started was, if you wanted access into any sort of system, dev or prod or whatever, uh, and we run on Amazon, so we don't have physical anything um, in our office. Everything is you know, in the cloud. So if you wanted access to any of our systems to VPN in, you had to set up a PGP key, because what I would do is I'd generate your VPN bundle and encrypt it with your PGP key, and then you could go ahead and grab it or I'd email it to you or whatever. Um, and so when every user started, anyone who wanted access to dev or prod or wherever they were going had to have PGP set up. And I had the most insane number of complaints on setting this up uh, for, because the mail clients, like no support for this, no support for that, whatever. Um, it was a huge pain. But we went through this process, we lived through the pain, we improved the docs, improved the tooling and everything else so that people could get set up uh, really easily. And now what we have is this wonderful world where everyone in the company has uh, encrypted email set up by default. I mean, we use Gmail for our stuff. We still need to get data around to each other. And it's everyone, including like product people and executives and things like that. Um, it's turned into a kind of a, a wonderful scenario that now we have this um, secure way of communication for people who probably are less security minded when it comes to um, you know, sharing sensitive data. And it took a lot of iterations. I mean, the first way we tried to set up user access and encrypting that data with PGP was, uh, was insane, it was terrible, everyone hated me for it. Um, and I could have just turned it off. I could have been like, you know what, forget about it. But um, instead we took the time, we improved it, we spent time to make it better. 
and it's a lot better than the alternative. Um, this might be too soon, but um, this, is, this is an email that sadly was part of the Democratic National Committee when they got hacked, and they're like, hey, we got hacked. Here's our new password, right? Um, <laughs> too soon, I know. Um, so packaging. This is actually a, an image of me trying to figure out how to make a Debian package. Um, so why is packaging a security issue? Well, there's been a recent prevalence in installing everything from, you know, bash scripts from GitHub as a way to install stuff or making stuff so easy that it's a one-liner uh, install script using curl and pipe it to bash. Um, and again, I'm not here really to hate on that. I think it solves a specific issue. Um, installing software is painful and, and, and people who provide services want software to be very easy to install. And going through a multi-page setup when you're trying to help someone get set up with some software, like, they're not going to make it through that. So is curl bash like the worst thing in the world? No, but you definitely shouldn't stupidly, you know, download data from the internet and run it. Again, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but it still happens all the time. You should take a quick look to see what it's doing. Um, you know, you should maybe see if this if this uh, vendor has packages, has signed repos. If they don't insist that they do, at ThreatStack, you can get started easily by downloading our software with a curl bash because people want a really quick way to try it right now. Um, but all that does is set up apt and yum repos and download from there. Um, and so we always try to get people to use the signed repos, but at the end of the day, like people want stuff that's fast. Um, they don't want to be slowed down. And, um, and so as secure as you can make it for them is really the best. So packaging has its own issues. Anyone here work for Red Hat? Nope. Sweet. <laughs> anyway, uh, so a few years ago, I'm going through building our threat stack agent uh, for Red Hat and for Debian and for a few other OSs, and I'm building up repos, and I, and I have um, you know I have my 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 key to sign these these packages and these repos, and but I don't want to use my main key. I want to use a sub key. So I, I I I get a sub key. I go and sign the the Debian repo when I deploy. Everything's great. I go and sign a, a Red Hat RPM with a sub key, and I get this error that I go through and find a mailing list article from 2006. And the response was essentially, for what it's worth, I have most of the subkey implementation done, uh, but it still won't solve your problem. It'll be years before that implementation is widely deployed. Um, so we're 11, almost 11 years now. Um, it is still, like, this still does not work. Um, and so again, this is a great scenario of like, you know, I'm trying to be secure, I'm trying to follow good practices, and, and nothing works. Um, this is why we can't have nice things. But you know what? I'm holding out hope, 2017. Uh, it's the year of subkeys and RPMs, I guess. So back to packaging, uh, I, I'm very against deploying directly from GitHub. Um, I think it suffers the same problem as a curl bash, which is that what you're pulling can change underneath you. Not necessarily you could say, oh, but signed commits and it, GitHub's SSL. That's great, but you know, if you're deploying from a tag and the tag changes or someone completely rewrites history or who knows what. At the end of the day, um, when it comes to installing software internally at, at ThreatStack, how we do it is we basically compile the code, we build a package, and then we can sign that package. And now that data, when it goes to prod, we have a signature that says it's the exact same as was tested in dev. I actually look at that as less of a security issue and more of just good operational practices, you're going to ensure that that package in prod is exactly what it was in dev. It didn't change along the way, not even for nefarious purposes, just for like someone made a quick, you know, quick commit at the last minute and went from there. Um, there are a bunch of tools to help you do this if you don't have an internal apt or yum repo. Most of my stuff you'll notice is, is basically Debian specific and Ubuntu specific. Um, it's because uh, if you have Red Hat, there's like whatever, R uh, repo, RPM create or whatever. There's basically one command and it works fine. And in Debian, there's like 15 commands and they all work fairly terribly. Um, if you don't want to set this up yourself, and I don't blame you, I mean, you can set a repo up on the cheap for, on S3 um, for, you know, pennies. Uh, if you don't want to do that, Package Cloud is a great service. Um, the, the founders uh, spend a lot of time improving the security of uh, repos and package installations, and so they have some local stuff. I'm, I'm not, I don't even use their service uh, currently because we just have it on S3, but um, they, it's incredibly simple to get up and running, so you don't have to do it yourself. So your company website Website, whatever website, SSL, right? Dead stop. The avocado, real avocado fact has an SSL certificate. If you're on Amazon, the Amazon certificate manager, it's free. Let's encrypt, right? Today is the day where there should be nothing unencrypted. We don't need, you know, one wildcard certificate installed in 600 places to save money. You know, we can use real certs. It all exists. So again, this is a no-brainer, but when you set it up, make sure it works right. Um, so I love this one. So this is more for the Debian people, but, you know, where's OpenSSL's default storage trusted CA files? Um, um, 
all over the place, right? And so make sure you put things in the right place um, because at the end of the day, it's hard. There's a lot of tech debt out there. This is a great example of tech debt when it comes to SSL. Um, so as you set them up, make sure to monitor them. And this is usually the joke where I say, everyone says, well, Pete, this seems so simple and easy. We, of course we do this stuff. Except, you know, Instagram cert failed. Uh, Gmail cert failed. Microsoft had two cloud outages two years in a row because the cert failed. And you know what happened is, is someone created that cert, renewed it for one year, left the company, someone else, and then it failed again, right? So um, monitor your certificates, not just for when they're going to die, but if anyone uh, hasn't ran SSL labs on, their, on any of their sites, it's gotta be a public site, but go and run this against anything public facing that you manage uh, on the SSL. And, and not only run it one time, but run it uh, via a script. So this is, we use Sensu for monitoring. This is just some, some light Ruby that will uh, call the, the Qualys uh, site, run a scan on everything external, uh, and it returns it back to me. And so it'll create an alert. If, if one of my sites drops below an A+, plus, um, I get alerted for it. The nice thing is, is as they improve the scan, then your nightly scans get kind of smarter and smarter. So Audit D and OSEC, anyone here use these tools? Audit D and OSEC? Um, you know, they're, they're, they're what's there. It's, they're not the best. If you like multi-line output, you're going to love Audit D. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the tools exist. Um, you can go and collect user access data from your systems and, and, and network and processes and things like that. You can capture all this data and, and start alerting and trending on it. And then also SE Linux or, you know, AppArmor, uh, just, just don't turn it off. Turn it off if you, you know, your application may not work with SE Linux, and that's totally fine. Um, but I often find people just say, I'm just going to turn it off instead of spending the time to um, actually make it work. Um, so you can take those tools and you can send them into open source tools like the Elk Stack, right? And you can get information. Even if you do nothing with it, you at least have it. Because later on, this data could have some massive value to you. If you get breached, or if just some internal user lifts some, uh, you know, lifts a database and and you know, nopes out a company, you've got some sort of access and tracking there. So continuous monitoring doesn't just stop at the host. If you're using any cloud services, um, you know, scan your systems, monitor them. Amazon, if you're using it, has CloudTrail. It has tools designed that you can use to, to capture it. And if you don't want to build this yourself, ThreatStack, uh, we have a booth out there. You can come check us out. I mean, uh, we live in a world where you can totally build it yourself and also you can just pay someone to get, um, you know, to get out of that one. So you don't need high tech uh, solutions to these problems. At the end of the day, you know, these are more likely people problems. So do you have an IR plan in place? Um, if you lost your laptop at this event, who do you call? Do you even know who to call? Um, a lot of times we have salespeople on trips. We've created an email that goes to PagerDuty and just pages like five people. So keep it simple though. I don't think you need to create this in-depth ITIL IR plan to deal with you know, issues in your environment. Like I said, a really simple way that if someone sees something weird that they can contact you. Um, because you're gonna have an engineer, they're gonna see something odd, they're gonna see just it's a database file on a server, but we don't do database dumps or, you know, I just seen this weird connection from an IP I don't know about. Where do they put that information? Where do they go to let someone know? It could be nothing, but it could be everything, right? Um, and so just have a way, there's always gonna be these weird attack vectors, right? Have an easy way that they can go through and, and notify people when this is happening. So you want to give people safe access to production. Um, this is usually where I talk about doing the DevOps and giving people wide open access. Um, we don't want people logging in all the time. It does compromise the system from not only an operational but also a security standpoint. Um, you know, if you do let people in though, it's trust but verify. And how do you verify? You use either a tool like ThreatStack, you could use Audit D, you capture all these events and that's how you verify people are accessing what they should be accessing and hopefully nothing more. So we want to treat our servers like cattle, not pets, right? We want to continuously monitor, monitor things. Um, collecting this data, again, you may use it today and you may not use it, but start small. Identify some high risk thing. Do you have two factor on your VPN device? Nope, go set that up. Um, are your passwords, you know, sitting in a one password doc? You can probably improve that. Maybe use one of those great secrets management tools that exist out there. But, you know, find your external servers and try to, you know, improve those. Because at the end of the day, you want to have a security conscious company. I think the best, um, like you don't want people to have the, the kind of the security asshole no one will go talk to you. Because if a bad thing happens, they're just not gonna tell you about it. Um, you wanna be open and welcoming with people, especially addressing security needs. You want them to come to you and let you know that there's an issue. 
Um, if there's one thing to good, to good thing to come out of the heart bleeds and the shell shocks and fridges that are just hacked everywhere that you can go is that it's making the news and people are talking about it and tools are getting created to help us out with that one. Um, you know, it's the Internet of Things that is, uh, you know, the other talk that the Dyn folks are giving about their DDoS. Um, you know, it's not Internet of Things as much as the Internet of Vulnerable Refrigerators. Um, this, this isn't going to get any easier. So the more we talk about this, the more we teach other people is, is, is how we can work together to build things more securely. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Did I leave any time for questions? Are there any questions? All right. Got a oh, we do. All right. Uh, you mentioned uh, GPG issues with both Yum and Apt. You commented a little bit on uh, Yum. Uh, I was wondering if you could follow up on the Apt issues. Yeah. So um, this is where it's going to be better to. Uh, there's there's been a few talks by uh, uh, Joe D'Amato was the one who gave the the conference talk at. Um, I'm trying to think if it was Monitorama or another one, but he's done a couple of conference talks recently uh, because with Package Cloud, he's working on you know building the Apton Yum repos. That was their first product, and he found a series of places where um, the uh, local verification of those um, of the GPG keys just didn't happen. Like the code path was never called, um, and he he found them in a bunch of different scenarios. So if you can give a search for Joe D'Amato, uh, Package Cloud. Um, he's written extensively on it, and. Uh, I won't even attempt to try to explain what he found because it is uh, it is far above my head. <laughs> yeah, so I'm just curious how you got uh, non-technical people to actually start using GPG. And you, um, I'm assuming <laughs> you didn't use the you're not using the Gmail web app because it has crap for actually you know, exactly. encrypted email. <laughs> yeah, so I guess we're we're lucky uh, in a couple of ways. One is you know we're 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 a we're a startup, so as people were added on, we could kind of follow the same model. The nice thing is, is we all use Macs. Uh, the Apple Mail uh, does do uh, secure email well. Um, uh, in the really early threat sec days, we did SMIME everywhere, and that worked uh, to some degree. But the whole security around SMIME, if you want my opinions, find me later. Um, but it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, so uh, essentially, we had to sit down with people, um, spend the time. Uh, it was definitely an investment, um, but luckily we have a very um, you know standard setup of you get the Mac and you'll have you know Mac mail and things like that. So um, if you if you have a larger business, if you got Apple, you know Macs, you got laptop, uh, Windows, Linux. Um, then unfortunately I can't help you with that one, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's basically like the premise was for us is we really wanted to spend the time and, and try to make it work. Um, and we had the, the pleasure of still being small enough that we could do it kind of one person at a time, so. Any other questions? Awesome. Thanks a lot.